Thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here to talk to you. Uh, am, am I good here? About osteoporosis. So this is going to be a bit of a shift in another direction. But I think as I heard some of our uh, previous speakers alluding to, osteoporosis is certainly important in people with PBC. Um, so I work at University Health Network, Toronto General Hospital. Um, we have a large liver clinic at University Health Network. And uh, certainly, I see a lot of people with PBC and other liver diseases in my clinical practice. So I was ambitious here. Uh, <laughs> maybe this isn't everything you ever wanted to know about osteoporosis, but I'm, I'm going to try to sort of provide you a fairly broad perspective about osteoporosis today. Uh, I'm going to tie it into uh, the relationship between PBC and osteoporosis or bone disease. Uh, preface that by saying there are, there's a lot we still don't know about that relationship, but certainly there are things we do. And then I'll talk to you about kind of our current approach to lifestyle changes and medications to reduce the risk for fractures. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today uh, does come from Osteoporosis Canada. And certainly anybody who's interested in a little more information about this, I would be happy to refer you to the uh, osteoporosis .ca website. There's a lot of excellent information about kind of our current understanding of bone disease as well as a lot of a lot of patient information about things like nutrition and exercise, really practical stuff. So let's start by talking about osteoporosis, fractures, and what we now uh, are using to assess fracture risk, uh, which are some of these 10-year fracture risk calculators. So this is osteoporosis. I don't have a pointer, but I think you can probably all appreciate that that bone uh, on the far side of the screen has a big hole and lots of little holes. And um, I think you can appreciate, hopefully, by that visual image, that that's a bone that's going to be weak. And that's a bone that, you know, given a bit of stress, a fall, something like that, is going to be at higher risk of breaking. And uh, the bridge on the other side of this image really reminds us that, uh, that for, for strength, for strength of the bridge or the bone, it really relies on the connection between you know, the horizontal pieces and the vertical pieces. And that's really what, uh, what gets lost in people with osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is, is really means porous bone or bones with holes in it. And this is the definition from the World Health Organization. So it's felt to be a skeletal disorder of compromised bone strength. So these bones are weaker. And that's related to low bone density. And many of you, maybe all of you, will have had a bone density test. That's what we can measure. And that's what we can kind of put a number on. Uh, but it's also related to changes in what we call bone quality. So that's uh, that, that's changes in these little trabeculae or connections in the bone um, that really we can't measure and we can't pinpoint quite so well on a bone density test. And the reason we worry about this, of course, is the consequence of a fragility fracture or really a broken bone that happens without, uh, without much trauma. So the definition is a broken bone that occurs spontaneously, which can happen, particularly in the spine, or with minor trauma, such as a fall from your own height, or a fall at walking speed or less. So that's what we consider a fragility fracture. Of course, bones break you know, with more trauma than that, a fall from a height, down the stairs, in an accident. Uh, but this is how we define fragility fractures. So when we talk about osteoporosis-related fractures, the three most common are the spine, and you can see that little arrow showing that that particular bone in the spine is compressed. Uh, a hip fracture, which tends to occur in older adults uh, and can have very serious consequences. And a wrist fracture, which is also important because it tends to happen in younger people and may actually be the first uh, clue that there are some issues with that person's bone strength. Uh, but in fact, we do see osteoporosis type of fractures in other bones. So the other common sites include a pelvis fracture, a fracture of the upper arm or humerus, um, and, and some other sites. Usually we don't consider fractures of small, kind of intrinsically weaker bones, osteoporosis fractures, so hands and feet and skull fractures don't usually count. And you know why do we worry about this? Well, 
fractures actually predict more fractures. So if you've had a broken bone in your spine, your risk of another broken bone in your spine becomes quite high. Um, and even if you've had you know, a broken wrist, that person, we know from some of these studies, some of these what we call cohort studies, like you heard about, uh, predict future fractures. And fractures lead to all sorts of uh, bad consequences, chronic pain, problems with mobility, really important consequences in terms of people's quality of life, loss of independence, costs, and, and even death. So the strategy, and this is an important strategy from Osteoporosis Canada, is try to identify people who are at risk, try to do things to change that risk, and try to uh, reduce the risk of some of these bad outcomes. So how common are fractures? And how common is osteoporosis? And I'm sort of talking in the bigger context, not specifically with PVC. But these are, uh, osteoporosis is very common and fractures are common. And you can see in this uh, diagram, which looks at Canadian women, if we just look at the, uh, the colorful bar at the end, the bottom, the purple, is hip fractures. Hip fractures are in a very similar ballpark to risk of heart attack, stroke, and breast cancer in women. And if we look at all the other important osteoporosis types of fractures, which are, are the rest of that colorful bar, including spine, wrist, pelvis, and other kinds of fractures, really fractures totally eclipse some of these other diseases. So this is an important problem and an important public health problem. So how do we, how do we assess your risk of fractures? Well, the first thing, and what many of you may have had done that we can do to try to get an idea of whether people have weaker bones and might be at risk of breaking their bones is what we call a bone density study. And this is assessed by something that's called dual x-ray absorptiometry. The machine looks a little bit like this. It's low radiation, um, considered a very safe study, and it's a very good measure of fracture risk. But it's really, I think we're, we're really learning more about the fact that it's not the only measure of fracture risk, so it needs to be used with other risk factors, which might include things like underlying medical uh, diseases in what's called a fracture risk calculator. So let's start by uh, looking at who needs a bone density. So this comes from the Osteoporosis Canada guidelines. So it's recommended that all men and women over 65 have a bone density study. For postmenopausal women and men 50 to 64, we look at other risk factors. So have you had a broken bone? Are you on any medications that might affect bone density, such as steroids? Um, so for example, people who have had transplants sometimes require those, or other medicines that put you at risk. And then we look at other conditions that might be associated with bone loss and fracture. And I've listed a few of these, but liver diseases are on that list, including uh, specifically what we call cholestatic liver diseases, and PBC is certainly an important one. And then we look at some of these other uh, factors, such as low body weight or weight loss, uh, family history, particularly if you have a parent who's had a broken hip, current smoking, and, and higher alcohol intake. We know those are all important risk factors. So anybody who's kind of doesn't quite meet the 65 cutoff, if they have some of those other risk factors, they should have a screening bone density. And for people who are younger than 50, it really has to be individualized. So this is what a bone density test looks like. So we look at two sites typically. We look at the spine and the hip. Sometimes we look at the wrist, uh, depending on the circumstance. And the bone density test actually gives us a little picture of what that area looks like. And it gives two numbers, a number called a T-score, which, um, which is how that person compares to a young normal reference population. And then something called a Z-score, which is how that person compares to an age-matched normal population. So this is the spine, and this is what the hip looks like. And you may hear these numbers bandied about, so I wouldn't worry too much about the details, but just so you know, for people less than age 50, we use the Z-score, and a Z-score of negative two or below, and for bone density, uh, basically we're looking at a standard deviation. Um, so the more negative the number is, the worse, the weaker the bones are. 
So a z-score of negative 2 or less is considered below the expected range for age. And then over the age of 50, we use these terminologies, including osteoporosis. So if you have that t-score of negative 2.5 or below, that's the definition of osteoporosis. And if you have that t-score of negative 2.5 or below and you've had a fracture with low trauma, that's considered severe osteoporosis. Normal bone density is a T-score of negative one and above. And in between is that kind of gray area of low bone mass. And in that range, it's really particularly important to look at things like other risk factors and looking at 10-year fracture risk. So, you know, when, when I see folks in the clinic, I look at a number of things. So uh, when I'm looking at their history, it's really important to know if they've had broken bones, and if they did, how did it happen? Have they had falls? You know, people who fall more often are clearly at higher risk of breaking a bone. And there's also things we can do to maybe reduce risk of falling. Look at things like whether they're on prednisone or steroid medications. Have they lost height? Uh, how much uh, calcium are they getting in their diet through dairy or other sources? Smoking, alcohol, family history, and then other high risk medical conditions or medications. <laughs> and then, you know, when I'm looking at physical exam, I'm really interested in, you know, have you lost any height? And more than two centimeters of lost height really is, might suggest that you've maybe had a silent compression in the spine, which can be really important. I look at weight. Is the weight low? Is the weight uh, decreasing? Does somebody have a curve of the spine? Do they have soreness in the spine, particularly in a particular spot, which might suggest a compression of one of those bones? And uh, you know, then a careful assessment of somebody's balance and how they walk, and maybe further tests, especially if they've had falls. And then there's a few kind of basic blood tests that we tend to look at in the osteoporosis clinic, including calcium levels, kidney and liver function, thyroid function, and and also vitamin D level. And it's important to know that most of us, maybe most of us in the room, if we happen not to be taking vitamin D supplements, will probably have a low vitamin D level, lower than what we uh, target for good bone health. And so generally, I don't measure a vitamin D blood test unless somebody's actually taking a supplement. So that's kind of what we do in the clinic. And then we, cut, we, then we put everything together. So we take the bone density test and all the other information and we look at these 10-year fracture risk assessment tools. And again, these are all available on the Osteoporosis Canada website. There's a little app if people are interested. And basically what you need to do is take the age, and this is the Canadian tool. It's the Canadian Association of Radiologists and Osteoporosis Canada fracture risk assessment tool. And it's very simplified. There's different graphs for men and for women. And you take the age, which is on the bottom part of the graph, and then the bone density, which is based actually on the hip bone density. That's kind of the best way of, of predicting a fracture, risk of a fracture. And, uh, and it assigns a risk which is low, which is less than 10% risk of a broken bone over 10 years, moderate, which is 10 to 20%, or high, which is considered greater than 20%. And generally, it's the people in the high risk range that really will benefit from medications. So for example, if you're 70 years old and you have a T-score of negative 2.5, that would be considered moderate risk. But there's a couple of things that modify that. So if somebody's had a broken bone, you go up a category. If somebody's on a higher dose of a prednisone type of medicine, go up a category. And for people who have had a spine fracture, a hip fracture, or more than one broken bone with low trauma, that somebody probably should be considered high risk almost no matter what. It uh, doesn't matter really what the bone density shows. The other thing that people may hear about is this FRAX tool. This is, uh, this is an initiative through the World Health Organization, which is another way that we can assess fracture risk. It takes into account a number of these other risk factors. You can see the check boxes. Uh, you can Google this, FRAX. Uh, it, it's a, you Google FRAX, F-R-A-X, and it gets you there. Um, and it gives you a risk of a major osteoporotic fracture, which is 
like the spine, hip, or wrist I told you about, and specific risk of a hip fracture. And so these are things that we can use when we're kind of looking at people and trying to make a decision about treatment. Okay, so what about PBC? How does that relate to osteoporosis? So we know that there is a relationship between liver disease and bone disease, and a couple of different kinds of bone diseases can happen. We are talking about osteoporosis specifically today, which is really low bone mass. Um, we also see what's something called osteomalacia with liver disease, and that's really uh, a problem with the mineralization of bone, and that's often related to vitamin D problems. So uh, we don't entirely understand um, what the reasons are for bone loss and liver disease, but some of the reasons, and I've listed them here, uh, that have been uh, discussed include maybe poor absorption of some of these fat-soluble vitamins, and for bone, the most important one is vitamin D. The liver also is important in vitamin D metabolism, so the vitamin D maybe that you get through pills or through your skin has to be activated in both the kidney and the liver to be fully active. And if the liver function is not good, you're gonna see abnormal vitamin D, especially the activated kind. Liver disease itself may cause what we call low bone turnover. So bones are a living tissue. They are always going through kind of a build up and breakdown cycle. And if that's reduced, we can see low bone mass. And then some of the medications that are used for treatment um, of different liver diseases can also affect bone. I don't think that's uh, so much with the medications used specifically for PBC, but for example, if people have more advanced disease and they end up maybe on steroid medications, or maybe if there's uh, uh, hepatitis associated with it, we know some of the antiviral medications can also affect bone. So what about PBC specifically and bone loss? Well, we know that both PBC and osteoporosis are more common in women as we get older. Um, we do see that low bone density occurs in anywhere from 20 to 50% of PBC patients looking at different studies. And we also know that in PBC, risk of fracture is increased, and maybe that's been an issue for some of you. Um, and we also know that risk of osteoporosis and risk of fractures is higher the longer you've had the disease, uh, PBC, and the more severe it is. And then other risk factors are kind of are common to osteoporosis in general, including older age, menopause, uh, low weight, and vitamin D deficiency. So a lot of uh, how we manage osteoporosis looks quite similar to uh, in, in people without PBC as it does in people with PBC. Oops. So I'm gonna go through all of these things in a little more detail in a minute, but the recommendations do include a baseline bone density study in people with PBC, particularly for uh, people over the age of 50. Everybody should really be evaluated for risk of fracture, and in particular, uh, if you've had a fracture with low trauma, uh, that's a really important risk factor for future fractures. And then everybody probably should be treated with appropriate calcium and vitamin D, weight-bearing exercise, and consideration of bone medication. And I'm going to get to all of those in a little more detail. And uh, just to show you that this is something that, uh, and this is a bit of a busy uh, flow chart that I, I don't want to go through in too much detail, but uh, this is from uh, an important medical resource that we often use uh, and, and references um, a, um, a publication in gastroenterology. And the first line up there is, does the patient have the following characteristics, which include cholestatic liver disease, which such as PBC, and an additional risk factor, and those are all the kind of risk factors I told you about, and um, this publication suggests everybody should get a bone density, or if somebody has liver disease and a fragility fracture, should have a bone density, and based on what that bone density shows, either consider uh, kind of these lifestyle measures or maybe a medication. Okay, so to talk in a little more detail about lifestyle medication, uh, lifestyle changes and medication to reduce the risk of osteoporosis, I'm gonna go through some of the uh, data or some of the guidelines from Osteoporosis Canada. So again, this is all available on that website. So basic bone health is probably important for everyone regardless of fracture risk and certainly anybody with underlying liver problems. And what they recommend is 
exercise, calcium, and vitamin D as a start. And the components of exercise, and I know some of you had talked about this uh, already in the context of PBC, uh, are, are actually quite specific for osteoporosis. So they talk about strength training, balance exercises, aerobic activity, and then postural strengthening exercises. And there's actually a program called Bone Fit. It can be found at bonefit.ca that really gives you a lot more detail about this. And they really emphasize the fact that walking, which we talk about a lot in other areas, is, is really not enough without strength or balance training to kind of address that muscle strengthening that's so important to help protect us from falls or fractures in osteoporosis. So the calcium piece. There's been a, a bit of controversy about calcium. Um, the current guidelines recommend that you try to get calcium through your diet, either through dairy or non-dairy sources. And there's a very nice calcium calculator on uh, the Osteoporosis Canada website where you can put in what you eat and get uh, some information about how much you're getting. And the recommendation is that you get a total of 1,200 milligrams of calcium per day through your diet. And if you're not getting enough through the diet, add a supplement to make it up to 1,200 milligrams. And vitamin D supplementation, probably for, for any of us in this room, should be 800 to 2,000 international units a day, which is recommended for adults over the age of 50 or anybody who's at risk for bone loss. And then the other, uh, the other aspects of basic bone health have to be a bit individualized, but really important to look at falls prevention strategies. And there's some great falls programs out there that can, uh, can address this and home safety. Of course, smoking cessation, reducing ca caffeine, reducing alcohol, and then having a look at other medications that might affect fracture risk. And, uh, and, and these really include drugs that can cause drowsiness, imbalance, or falls. And in fact, some of them were, were even mentioned uh, in the previous session. Uh, you know, even, even drugs like, uh, like Lyrica or sleep medications can certainly affect your risk for falls. And uh, of course, other drugs that can be associated with bone loss, we try to minimize those. And then we look at who needs medications. So it's uh, generally agreed on that women or men at high, so that's greater than 20%, uh, risk of fracture over the next 10 years will benefit from taking a bone medication. And that can either be based on the bone density and calculation of 10-year fracture risk, or based, as I said, on whether you've had a broken bone, uh, including the important hip and spine fractures, or more than one fracture. And we have a kind of short list of medicines uh, that are in common use for osteoporosis. So the most frequently used medications are what we call anti-resorptive bone medications. So remember I told you before, bones are always going through that build up and breakdown cycle. The anti-resorptive bone medicines block the breakdown of bone and allow for building. And these include the bisphosphonate medications, including alendronate and resedronate, which are pills that are taken once a week or once a month. And we also have an intravenous medicine that way. And then we have prolia or denosumab, which is uh, an injection that you take once every six months. Uh, some of the less frequently used medications include hormone therapy and uh, our riloxifene, which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, which I think in your group probably have to be used with uh, a lot of caution or maybe not at all. And then we have one, one bone building medicine, teriparatide, which is really only used in, in the most severe osteoporosis or special circumstances. So an oral bisphosphonate is usually the first line medicine, but if people have more advanced liver disease, if they have uh, varices in the esophagus, we may consider an injection or an intravenous medicine because the pill form of these medications can be quite irritating to the stomach and the esophagus. Okay. And this is just here to remind me that uh, this is also from the guidelines. These medications are very effective. They reduce your risk of breaking a bone, a spine uh, fracture by about 60%, and uh, other fractures by somewhere around uh, 25 to 40%, depending on the medication. So I think we're going to probably skip through these because we are uh, a little short of time, but I'm happy at the uh, break if anybody has any specific questions about these medications, I'm happy to talk about them. And then we uh, usually recommend 
the patients have a follow-up bone density in about one to two years for people who are taking a bone medication or people who otherwise are at higher risk and for uh, various reasons have chosen not to take a medication. And people who are at lower risk with PBC generally should have a bone density measured in two to five years. And then if somebody's had a new broken bone, uh, that's an important time to kind of reassess, make sure we're doing the right thing and see whether there may be a better choice of treatment. And then the other thing with bone medication is we now understand that these are not medications uh, that in all people should be used kind of continuously and forever because of particular risks of, of long-term use. So it's recommended that patients who take a bone medicine are reassessed at about five years. So hopefully we've covered uh, most of these uh, topics and happy to entertain any questions. I've actually put a couple websites up there. Uh, I don't know why they're so light, but uh, happy to provide them for you as well uh, for anybody who looks, who's interested in looking at more information. Thanks very much.